Alaska, where there are old triumphs, but also new frontiers, with challenges as great as the state itself, but a belief the best is yet to come, bringing you the faces, the places, and the spirit of the last frontier. This is Frontiers with Rhonda McBride. Welcome to Frontiers. This week, we take a walk on the wild side, and we start with one of the biggest wildlife management projects the state has ever undertaken, and probably the longest to get off the ground. After more than 20 years in the making, a dream to restore the wood bison to the wild has finally been realized, and KTVA's Lauren Maxwell is here to share that story with us. Lauren, amazing story. It is pretty incredible. You know, Rhonda, there's no one alive right now that remembers wild wood bison <laughs> in Alaska, but apparently they were once pretty common in our state. The effort to reintroduce them to the wild has been going on for a long time. It's taken a lot of work to launch this project and get them back into the wild. We were lucky enough to follow their journey from Portage to the village of Shagaluk. The wood bison at the Alaska Wildlife Center in Portage have no idea how special they are. These animals, or their predecessors to these animals, were almost extinct at one time. These are the only wood bison in the entire U.S. And pretty soon, they'll be making a move that will literally be making history. This is a bringing back of a species that was here for thousands of years. Wood bison disappeared from the Alaskan landscape about 200 years ago, and the plan to bring them back is ambitious. A hundred bison from the center will move to western Alaska to start a new herd in the wild. But before they do, the logistical challenges are beyond belief. They have to get there. Although the project was decades in the making, these are the pens that hold them in place. When it finally got the go ahead, biologists had just six months to design the special containers that would carry the bison inside a cargo plane to their new home. And you figure this is the, the width of a bison. 30 and a half inches is what we've got. And then, only days to practice getting the animals in safely. All the while, working to keep them calm and headed in the right direction. If there's a problem with the behavior of the bison, we have to stop, slow down, and figure it out. All of those things have to fall into place for this to happen. On moving day, it's clear that practice has paid off. From the box, to the truck, and finally the plane. It's a smooth landing on the airstrip in Shagaluk. The flight has taken a little over an hour, and biologists are anxious to get the animals out of the containers and onto the pasture land that surrounds the village. One by one, the bison are released to join other members of the herd who arrived earlier. Some seem especially tentative. Others are in a hurry. It's a thrill to watch. Look, they're here. Especially for villagers documenting a day they never thought they'd see. Well, this will be their permanent home. I know. Can you believe that? Yeah. I can't believe that. <laughs> That's crazy. For the next few years, scientists will track the animals using radio collars to see where they go and how they adapt to life in the wild. They don't know what's good to eat, what's not good to eat, where to go to get it. They don't know where the water sources are what might eat them and what might not. Um, it's a huge experiment for these guys. But while the project is sure to yield scientific knowledge, others hope for something more. Maybe tourists will be coming in and, you know, for economic uh, opportunities. Arnold Hamilton is one of the 65 people who live in Shagaluk, where most homes have no running water and jobs are hard to find. He says many families have moved away. We're afraid of our school. We're right on the borderline. Oh. You know, if a couple students leave, well, they'll have to shut it down. Mm. So yeah. you want more families to be back here? Well, that's what we want. And maybe the bison will be a draw. Maybe, hopefully. But on this day, at least, there are plenty of people in Shagaluk. Families from surrounding villages have traveled hours on snow machine 
to watch one of the last loads of bison be released. I, th I think that's wonderful. What a majestic creature. A new beginning for the herd and a relief for those involved. I'm in awe. Everything has worked so well, so well. A project years in the making is getting off to a very good start. Now we shot that story a couple of months ago when we left the bison were still in a temporary pen, but within a few days the pen came down and for the first time ever the bison were truly roaming free. So a lot of times as reporters we sort of bear witness to history. What was that experience like for you? It's so unimaginable to think that you could pack them in a plane and you know take them from one part of the state to the other and then see them released. I mean it really was pretty incredible. Well, thanks, Lauren, for following them from their beginnings in Anchorage, near Anchorage and to Shagalock. Appreciate that. Well, it has been a while since the bison were flown to their new home. Some new members of their herd to meet, born shortly after their arrival. When we come back, we'll get an update from the project's leaders. For more than 60 years, Bernard Builder Supply has helped Alaskans build. Build their backyard barbecues, their curb appeal, their arsenal, and their hideaways. From helping you pick the perfect decking, to mixing paint that's just the right shade, to finding the power tool that pulls it all together, SBS is here to build with you. From ground, to roof, to everything in between. Now offering financing with no payments or interest for 12 months. Visit us today at your local Spinard Builder Supply. The Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium provides comprehensive health services for Alaska Native and American Indian people across our state. In addition to world-class care at the Alaska Native Medical Center, our work delivers health services for rural Alaska. From cutting-edge technology for the best care possible to modern construction of clean water systems and health clinics to health training and outreach that honors our culture, our vision is that Alaska Native people are the healthiest people in the world. Sometimes it's the smallest things that make the biggest difference. For author and professor Willie Hensley, it was the family member who took him in and cared for him when his mother no longer could. And his first boss, who encouraged him to further his education. We can all work together to make sure the littlest Alaskans grow up to achieve their biggest dreams. For small steps you can take to make a big difference, visit alaskachildrenstrust.org. Start small, dream big. Alaska Children's Trust. I think the Teacher of the Week segment is extremely important because teachers are important. They partner with parents in educating children to teach them right from wrong. I just think specifically when it comes to education, to letting those teachers know that they are appreciated and they're doing a phenomenal job. Anytime someone goes above and beyond what's expected, they should be patted on the back. They should be given accolades. It helps give them that extra push. One of the things that we'd like to explore here on Frontier is how Alaskans meet challenges posed by some of our unique circumstances. And from the get-go, the Wood Bison Project had many. And joining us now to give us an appreciation of all that was involved, we have Tom Seaton, who is the lead biologist for the Wood Bison Project, as well as Kathy Harms, who is a regional manager for the Department of Fish and Game. You know, we still have another chapter in this story to talk about, uh, to follow up on what Lauren shared with us. Uh, we understand that there are some babies now. You want to tell us about that? That's true, yeah. In the last uh, few weeks we've been having some young calf uh, wood bison and we're up to six as of a couple days ago and uh, uh, it's pretty exciting to see them out walking around there in the wild. Now I understand that you planned it that way so that they would be born out in the wild. Right that was one of the key components of getting the bison to stay where we put them is to have them calve not long after we put them there because uh, where these animals calve they tend to uh, focus on that place um, in the future uh, that it really an kind of anchors them to a place. So how are they doing? You know, they're young, vulnerable. The calves, uh, they're doing quite well. They look great. They, you know, trotting along behind the cows as the cows do their thing. Then it's pretty neat to see. Um, uh, you know, we won't know. The main thing we'll be able to measure is their survival, you know, over the summer and over, over the years. And so uh, um, it remains to be seen how well they do. Well, we have had some, some animals lost already. Is that a big setback for the project? Um, 
You know, any animal loss is unfortunate, um, and we're a little bit sad about that, but, but we expected that. We expected quite a bit of mortality. If you can imagine these animals that have been in captivity for several years now uh, in the wild, and they're um, trying hard to get to understand their environment and, and learn how to live in it, and uh, that's a difficult thing to do. And um, there's a lot of water bodies around um, this area where we put them, and uh, we expected there'd be drowning and, and ice issues. And, so uh, that's how those other Well, nine of the died. 14 died from drowning, falling through um, rotten ice, and uh, uh, the other five just died from stresses of being reintroduced, um, which uh, we're still investigating, but it has generally has to do with um, uh, just uh, not being able to, to make the conversion from one to the other, just too much stress. Yeah, well, too. you know, something like this, this is such an amazing logistical Thing. Uh, Kathy, you know, you sort of bore witness to this. Do uh, you think that it's amazing that, that you're still at this point with some of them still out there? I, I think what a lot of people don't realize is that by the time Tom got the word, it's a go, you're going to do it, he had six months to put everything together. So, yeah, the project's been around for more than 20 years, but in six months, all of the transportation took place, all of the plans, designing the bison box, getting the bison box made, acquiring the boxes to have them converted to bison boxes, arranging with the airplane, making sure the airplane could land at Shagluck, making sure the time of year was right. Not too late because we want the calves to be born out there, but we don't want it breakup to have happened. So getting the timing, is the runway going to be still frozen enough to land the airplane? And that was a big plane. It was a Herc, a C-130 Hercules, yeah. And so all of those things put together, I mean, Tom just did an amazing job of planning for every last detail and still being flexible for some things we didn't plan. <laughs> well, you know, speaking of planning, I guess the planning isn't over because you've, you've got some bulls uh, that are left behind in Portage. Right. We still have 28 bulls that we want to take out, and uh, that's going to happen uh, by barge. So we're going to drive them up the Parks Highway to Indiana, and then they'll go downriver by barge. And uh, we'll do it in two trips because the... Uh, the barge that we're going to use is uh, is too small to take them all at once. So why did you leave the bulls behind? Well, uh, they're uh, a little bit hard to handle in a soft release environment. So the first animals, we did what's called a soft release. So we take them there, we keep them in a holding pen until everything's calmed down and they're kind of used to the area, and then we gently release them. Um, we didn't really want the bulls in that in that kind of soft release environment because they're a little bit hard to handle and a, a little much bigger to deal with. That's one reason. The other reason is uh, they're just so heavy. You know, they're up to 2,500 pounds, and uh, uh, the other animals <laughs> <laughs> are 500 to 1,000. So we can just get a lot more bang for our buck by flying the smaller animals out there. And that's really was essential to have the young animals and the cows out there. Um, it's not. If we were to fail at some point, it would be okay to not take as many bulls out there. But uh, now that we can and we've, and we've successfully gone so far, then the next step is to get the get Okay, the bulls so out. explain the routing for this because this, this sounds way more complicated <laughs> than just taking the plane and flying a bunch out it there. Is a little bit so where do they go from Portage? Well, I'll start out by saying it's about a thousand mile trip. And so at Portage, um, we load them in the same containers that we loaded the cows into, but they're, they're kind of rearranged in a way that they have, they have a lot more room because they're going to spend more time in the container. Um, then they get trucked to Ninana, which, as you know, is 300 and some miles. It's an all-day trip. Um, and then they get moved onto the barge, and then the barge goes down the Tanana from Ninana to the mouth um, at where it's the Yukon at Tanana Village. And then it goes down the Yukon all the way to down by Holy Cross, which is covers most of the state you know, from east to west. And then uh, turns back up the Anoko to get where uh, past Shagaluk to where the cows are now. And we, we want to release those bulls as close as possible to where the cows are so they can make a connection. There. Well, Kathy, what about fish and game's structure, their culture? I mean, this, is, this has got to be a project that really stretches it, well, tests it. A, a lot of fish and wildlife management agencies, state agencies, are dealing with what's present. And that's what the department's job is. It's to manage the wildlife to make sure they're there in the future for a variety of different uses by people. What, Alaska doesn't get the chance that some states do very often of putting back something that's missing. Um, Alaska only had two large land species that were missing. One was muskox, and that was taken care of in the 70s, but totally different way than we did muskox, or did wood bison. This was the last missing piece of an ecosystem that disappeared a couple hundred years ago or so that we could put back. I mean, there was basically a hole in the ecosystem that was shaped just like a wood bison. 
And when we put it back in there, now we've got all the pieces. So what's next for the project? Well, intensive monitoring. I mean, monitoring. beyond getting those bulls yeah, out there. Yeah, well, once we get the bulls there, <laughs> no small task. But when that's done, and what's happening right now is just intensive, intensive monitoring of the animals that are out there. We want to understand how they uh, learn and interact with their environment and how we could do this better next time if there is a next time. Um, uh, just try to monitor as best we can. Well, what are some of the, the challenges in monitoring them? Because I understand they, they're outfitted with radio collars. One of the biggest challenges is the place where they are is a long ways from anywhere, and uh, just trying to get to them um, is, is difficult. Uh, it uh, has some coastal influence with the weather, and so it's often poor flying weather, and that's really the only way to access them is by air. Um, and then, uh, yeah, just keeping track of all, all the different animals. It's, it's not well, just easy. quickly, so did they, did they stick around? Did they disperse? I mean, what do you know so far? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, we had our ideas of what could happen, and they didn't, they made the conversion to wild <laughs> much faster than we predicted. We hauled literally tons and tons of feed out there for them to kind of keep them uh, where we'd first released them and, and make sure they had plenty of good nutrition as they converted to natural forages and all that. And uh, the first day, they just blew by all the feed and took off and went, uh, not all of them, <laughs> but about half of them went about 12 miles north in the first 24 hours. Um, and they kind of hung out there for a few days and then they actually kind of came back to the feed and then a lot of them stayed with the feed and kind of used both um, uh, native forages and the feed back and forth. And then uh, they've kind of moved all over, but they've kind of stayed in that general area. It's as much as 16 miles north of the release point and then kind of east or west five miles. So it's, it's kind of right in there. But in the last couple days, that kind of more mobile northern group took a big arc and went way east of Shagaluk out in the hills and ended up about 10 miles south of Shagaluk and crossed the river a couple nights ago. Well, Tom, uh, we're out of time, yeah. but we are <laughs> going to continue this conversation on our website, ktva.com. And there's always more to talk about. And right now, though, it's time to turn from bison to bears. And when we come back, we go to Government Hill where some rogue bears have been causing a lot of challenges. We have a story, a story of 27 families that put 18 months of their lives into building a village, a home for themselves and their future. Our Inupat culture goes back thousands of years carried by a strong sense of community. Our relationship with our natural surroundings is at the heart of our culture. By investing in future generations through development that is balanced with the love of our land, the Gupi Corporation brings together traditions of the past with visions of the future. Let's never forget the cost of freedom or take it for granted. As a veteran, you are entitled to certain benefits when you pass. To learn what benefits are included, ask for our free Veterans Information Kit and learn how a smart plan can provide all of the things that are not covered. We all enjoy the freedom you provide for us, and we thank you for your service. This is Dominic Kassar, owner and operator of the Cremation Society of Alaska. Call us at 277-2777 or visit our website. You can't get very far until you start doing something for somebody else. Lions Club. We serve our community through vision screening and donating eyeglasses to those in need. We serve by promoting fun, safe, and competitive youth activities statewide. Together, we serve by staging events like blood drives, food collections, and the Miners and Trappers Charity Ball. Lions Club is young and old, men and women, giving back to the communities they serve. Won't you join us? Call or visit our website to find out how. With the new KTVA 11 News live stream, you can stay up to date on Alaska news, sports, and weather every day from anywhere. In Homer. In Tanana. From the Capitol. At Denali Base Camp. From McGrath. Here at the Port of Anchorage. In Kodiak. Here on Prince of Wales Island. From Barrow. In North Pole. And we mean anywhere. Portland. From Boise. From Denver. In Washington, D.C. From Reykjavik, Iceland. From Afghanistan. At 35,000 feet above South Dakota. Try it today at ktva.com slash stream. What most of us love about Alaska is that even in a city like Anchorage, we get a sense of being on the edge of our frontier, thanks to the moose and bears who dwell amongst us. But sometimes things get a little too close for comfort, as we saw in Government Hill recently when a bear family outwore their welcome. 
There were plans to kill them, but after Governor Bill Walker gave them a stay of execution, they were captured and released in a remote area on the Kenai Peninsula. Still, questions linger. Anchorage, a city where people and wildlife usually live peaceful, parallel lives. Except when bears come looking for garbage. Can you blame this sow and her four cubs for developing a taste for Government Hill's garbage can buffet? Hanging around for seconds and thirds. Biologists blame not the bears, but the humans for their sloppy handling of trash. They say that's what gets bears killed. For now, the Government Hill bears have a new lease on life, and while they may be gone, they're not forgotten. At least parents feel better about letting their kids play outside. They knock them down. Yeah, all of the, all of the trash in the whole city. While the kids still talk about the bears, when it comes to the trash, there seems to be more than just talk, but action. Government Hill has cleaned up its act. These guys are doing a much better job. Rick Sinnott is a retired biologist with a long history of dealing with bears gone rogue. And almost always, it's trash that gets them into trouble. If people are putting those things out on the curb the night before, then a bear has 12 hours to get into any amount of food. See how much food there is right there? You can imagine. Rick says a third of the stuff we throw out is edible. One of those cans would be enough to feed a cub, and easily two of them would be, have enough food in them to feed um, an adult bear for a night. While the community is glad the bears weren't killed, Rick Sinnott questions whether it was a good idea to move them. In a sense, it's almost like throwing a, a grenade down on the Kenai. It didn't take the sow and her cubs long to seek out humans. They were spotted in the tiny town of Hope on the Turnigan Arm. But they moved on, probably because they didn't find any garbage on the menu. Biologists say this sow is quite capable of finding food in the wild. She was just a very calm, passive bear. She was not aggressive. Sean Farley probably knows more than most about this bear. He's been acquainted with her since 2011. She's Bear 15. No, I don't name the bears. Bear 15. Sounds like a boring name for a brune who has caused so much excitement. But thanks to a bear cam attached to her collar in 2013, we do know quite a bit about her. For example, she sleeps in trees above houses, checks out lawn art, and has climbed a staircase. The bear cam also caught her in the act stealing chicken feed and running into traffic. We learned that she was a bear that would come into town and go all the way to Westchester Lagoon and hang out there, eat natural foods on the hillside and travel through town up the green belts. She's a bear that'll get into garbage, but at the same time, if there's natural food, she takes advantage of that. When the Devil's Club berries came into to season, she disappeared. She likes elderberries too, and dandelions, as well as insects in a log. Perhaps in her new home on the Kenai, Bear 15 will pass on her ability to subsist on natural foods. But there's not much time. Her cubs are about ready to go off on their own. Once she boots them off, their probability of, of surviving is probably about 50% or so, and that's true no matter where they were. They won't have their big, strong mom to protect them from bad choices. They can't swim that river, they don't realize it, and they drown to they get too close to a larger uh, bear that kills them, or wolves take them. If they survive, what then? Make a prediction, Rick. When will the bears return here? <laughs> I don't know. I, I've been meaning to ask the fishing game guys if there's an office pool you know, for what day the bears will make it back. Senate says he knows of one case in which a bear swam across Turnigan Arm. We think it was watching the tide. So the tide goes down, the tide goes up, tide goes down, the bear goes, I can make it across. The bear just shot right straight across Turnigan Arm at Bird Creek. The currents are probably too strong for young black bears to manage, so a swim across the inlet isn't likely. But in the meantime, there are other bears foraging on Jay Bear, a military compound nearby Government Hill. Could they be the next unwelcome guests? If we could see odors, like they can smell them, it'd be like watching a, uh, a huge fire smoke billowing up over on Point McKenzie, and you could see the smoke kind of coming your way. Although Government Hill, for the most part, seems to be putting its odor fires out, we did find some smoke in one of its parks. Oh, see, there's some food in there. 
some peas and some cream sauce. Bird seed, still plentiful pickings in this neighborhood, another big no-no. But sometimes what attracts bears isn't obvious. Nice, you know, nicely done, but it just has a big hole right here that a bear can easily stand up here and reach in and grab something out. That might be tea, but if it has sugar in it, you know, a bear will spill it and lick it up. Don't believe it? Back in 2013, the bear cam shows Bear 15 slurping up a leftover drink. And one more bear cam shot to leave you with. Bear 15 eating trash while watching a jogger. The good news? The city is putting these bear resistant trash cans in Government Hill parks. That'll help cut down on the smells. I've heard, yeah, I've heard there's another bear in the neighborhood, but that maybe it moved on. It was awful nice of them to move those five bears. Moving on, and we hope never to return. So what does Rick Sennett think about the governor's reprieve for the bears? He says he's glad Bill Walker is responsive to the public, but he worries his decision might come back to haunt him, that people might bypass normal fish and game channels for dealing with problem bears. And the governor could wind up being the go-to guy. And probably not a good idea because managing bear complaints is very, very time consuming. Next week, in our Memorial Day edition of Frontiers, we look back on the life of Charlie Etock Edwardson. Now, unless you follow Native politics, he's probably not someone that you may have heard about. But during the Native land claims battle in the 1960s, Etock was a force to be reckoned with, even among Alaska Native leaders who had sort of a complicated love-hate relationship with him. We could not afford to be erratic. Right, in our negotiations, and, and that's a role that Charlie could play. He could ask for the moon and, and, and help make our, our demands seem more responsible. Charlie was the sort of fellow in a negotiation that if you didn't have him as the radical possibility, you would probably want to invent him. He considered himself, I think, a revolutionary. Emil Noddy, Willie Hensley, and Byron Malott share their memories of a man who made a difference, but in a very different way. You can see what we mean next week on Frontiers, Remembering Etoc. Well, we want to thank you for joining us in the conversation. And from all of us at KTVA, may you find your own frontier.